My name is Cody Furl, and I will be talking about the Moncada attack, birth of the Cuban Revolution, by Antonio Rafael de la Cova. A little bit about the author. Antonio Rafael de la Cova is a Havana native. He was a boy in Cuba when Castro took power. He remembers his mother waking him up and telling him the news. He's assistant professor of Latino studies at Indiana University. He holds a PhD in history from West Virginia University, and as of today, he has written two books about Cuba. The Cuban Revolution was born at Moncada, says Celia Sanchez, who was one of the revolutionaries with Castro during the attack. I'm not going to say that we went to Moncada to make a socialist revolution. We went, we went there with the idea of making a change so that better men might govern and so that men would not steal. We went to Moncada as disciples of Marti, said Melba Hernandez, also one of the rebels with Castro. One of the things the author tries to do with this book is disprove some of the previous inaccuracies with other books. A lot of other books misrepresent or twist the facts, and many authors take the official Castro story at its word, but it was largely revised after he came to power. The author does this by a series of interviews with both the military and the rebels, research, official reports, photos, and other first-hand experiences since he lived in Cuba at the time. Fidel Castro was born Fidel Alejandro Castro Ruiz, August 13, 1926. His father was a wealthy farmer. He went to elementary school at Salé Catholic School in Santiago de Cuba, and Fidel was a very violent child who got in fights almost daily, according to his brother Raul. He was enrolled in a Jesuit high school. There he received the nickname the Redneck and El Loco. It was a very class-conscious elite school, and he grew to resent his more rural upbringings. While in high school, he excelled in sports and was chief of the Baleen Explorers, which is analogous to the Cub Scouts. In sports, he had to win. He saw it as a way to gain attention and show that he was a true leader. While in high school, he learned the Spanish Jesuit teaching of his Hispanidad. The teaching was about the moral and spiritual values of the Spanish, and it rejected the liberal democracy of America. He went to college at the University of Havana, where he was involved with many revolutionary groups, such as the Popular Socialist Party, the Socialist Revolutionary Movement, and the Insurrectional Revolutionary Union. Being a member of the IRU, Castro carried a gun and was very violent. Part of his group activities was an attempted murder, which he failed at. After his college years, he traveled to Venezuela, Panama, and Bogota. While in Bogota, he took part in the Bogotazo. He helped a group of rebels overrun a police station and get some guns. Around this time, he started to build a following. He chose his followers from Orthodoxo Youth Rank. He swayed his followers with his fiery speeches, and he chose his followers from lower social and educational classes. He liked to tower above his followers. Around this time, he started planning a revolution. He and his followers were displeased with the Batista government. Fidel Castro knew it was necessary to act fast. Two other groups of rebels had met in Canada and formed a pact that they would overthrow the Batista government by the end of the year. Part of Fidel Castro's plan was to borrow and save money so that he could buy guns and ammunition. They started buying ammo in bulk from any store they could. He was also able to get schematics and uniforms from a military officer who worked at the Moncada Barracks. They decided to attack on July 26, 1953, under the cover of Carnival. Because it was such a big celebration, they were able to slip into the town relatively unnoticed. This is a layout of the Suborny farmhouse. Some of Castro's followers were able to rent the house under the false pretenses that they were farmers looking to set up shop. It was relatively close to the barracks, so it was an ideal location. This is a picture of the Moncada barracks where Fidel Castro and his followers attacked. This is where they entered. This is an aerial view of the Moncada garrison. The Moncada attack was a strategic failure. As Castro's followers were moving into place, they realized that they had small caliber weapons and mismatched ammunition. Castro lied so that his followers would follow through with the attack. He told them that they had military support. 
and that they would even get aerial support from the Air Force. Before they even made it to the attack, many deserted or their cars broke down along the way, stranding them on the side of the road. The uniforms they were wearing were either too big or too small. Castro's was too small because he was over six feet tall. The soldiers noticed them almost immediately and gave the order to shoot the ones wearing tennis shoes. This is the layout of the Moncada garrison. As you can see, Castro and his followers came in this way and entered through post three. Because of the carnival, carnival festivities and the time of day, soldiers weren't allowed to go in outpost three, but Castro and his followers didn't know this. This is where the attack started. Raul Castro and a band of, of rebels went up this way and attacked the Palace of Justice. It was a simple task and Raul did not fire a single shot. Another group also attacked the military hospital. A simultaneous attack was also planned for Bayamo. Another band of rebels came along this route and entered the back of the barracks where there was a double barbed wire fence. The attack failed almost immediately because one of the followers forgot to bring the wire cutters. A guard was on, on patrol and came through this way when he heard the racket. The rebels became scared and fired on the soldier. After the attack was a failure, Castro and the rebels dispersed to the countryside. Castro and a small band of rebels wandered through the countryside for several days, going no farther than five miles from the Moncado barracks. While in the hills, Castro started to negotiate his surrender. The author dispels some of the myths of Moncada, particularly the Black Legend. Castro stated that he and his rebels were treated harshly and that some were tortured. As I had stated previously, Castro and Raul did not fire a single shot. Part of the Black Legend was perpetrated because of Sergeant Gonzalez. One of the rebels' mothers overheard him on a bus saying that if he saw any of the rebels, he would gouge out their eyeballs and cut out their tongues. This was only a story, and it was used to Castro's advantage. Sergeant Gonzalez's nickname was actually El Mulo because he worked with the mules during the war, but part of Castro's revisionist history changed it to El Tigre, or the Tiger. Fidel and the rebels received a speedy trial Castro avoided attempts on his life several times, and he acted as his own attorney. His closing argument was a two-hour diatribe, which eventually became history will absolve me. As a political prisoner, he and the other rebels had special rights. Their special status meant they received special treatment. They were confined away from the regular prisoners, and they were able to get books, write letters, and Castro even wrote propaganda. Here he started reading about communism. He used his time in prison to maneuver and make himself a national icon. He eventually received a political pardon and was released from prison. Outside of prison, he wrote many articles and journals attacking the government, initiating a war of words. There was eventual government instability and Castro and his followers went to Mexico to start guerrilla warfare. Some good and bad about the book. The good, Delacova uses his primary accounts to give a relatively unbiased look at the Moncada attack. His first-hand experiences help with his argument. He cuts through the myths and lies, and he gives incredible details. Everyone mentioned is sketched out with a full family history and what they did before and after the attack. Some of the bad. He is less than impartial when attacking some of Fidel Castro's claims. This is due in part to his life in Havana. He also fails to deliver on Hitler comparisons. In the beginning of the book, he stated that he would show how Hitler and Fidel Castro were similar people, but those paragraphs are only in the beginning and very end of the book. He, he does not explain it in as much detail as some of his other things. And the rest of the story, after Fidel Castro exited prison, he rushes up to the mid-1960s and leaves out some of the details of the previous chapters. After Fidel Castro leaves prison, 
the details of how he rose to power are generally skipped over. With such a detailed account of the previous years in Castro's life, it's odd to see the author generalize his rise to power. That is left up to the audience to figure out.